Hey everybody and welcome to Get Indie Gaming and to our annual end of year countdown of the best indie games that launched over the year. It's been a vintage one full of surprises, variety and breathtaking achievements so please settle in for our top 10 most compelling, entertaining, thought provoking and fun indie games we played over the course of 2018. Let's begin this countdown with Unavowed and here we have one of the finest point and click adventures we've seen in years. There's always talk of the death of this genre and yet time and time again we find superb examples to show those uttering such statements of waffle that silence on such matters would be a more rounded approach. Unavowed sees you battling demons across New York with an Astorian overall world environment with the graphics, gameplay and character creation that feels fresh and complex as anything coming from Bioware either today or from their back catalogue. To dwell on this a little longer, the greatest achievement and most enjoyable aspect of Unavowed comes from the writing and the portrayals of the characters within it. They are the strongest we've seen all year across the AAA market, never mind the indie gaming scene. The skill from the lone writer to gel something like this into one cohesive and incredibly detailed journey that has oodles of replayability without having to resort to hackneyed approaches often seen within such adventure games, well it's just so very epic. A word that perfectly sums unavowed and what we really think of it. If point and click games are something you usually avoid, take a few moments to think about what it is about the genre that puts you off. We're pretty sure unavowed will paper over any such concerns. Go buy this, it's honestly worth doing so. At number 9 and out on iOS and Android early in the year, Florence is something people often ask if it's really a game, so let's caveat that here and now. Let's call it an interactive, casual gaming experience that's centred around a story about love, art and what drives the creative process. Now, now bear with us. With the Mr Bean approach to localization with little or no dialogue, Florence uses visual nudges via the touch screens to piece together the life of the titular Florence. An office worker who spends her commute flicking through images on her phone while letting the evenings pass her by in front of the TV. Florence is not a lengthy experience. There's under 45 minutes of playtime with its puzzles and interactive sections being perfectly made for playing on, say, a standing commute with one hand and one thumb controlling the game whilst the other holds onto a handrail to stay upright. Florence is tough to discuss without spoilers, so there's a quick warning on what follows. Although as a view into romance and love, for better or worse, it's brutally honest. Relationships can be hard work. Florence eloquently showcases why this is sometimes the case. In Florence, we have a couple whose partnership is ultimately one of convenience, where the relationship becomes one of dependence and when this need or desire wears thin, their attachment wanes, leading to a separation. With an interweaving story easily compared to La La Land, Florence, while bleak in places, well, it feels altogether a bite-sized piece of tenderness. Number 8, The Messenger, hit the PC and Switch late August and digs up a whole heap of nostalgia from the days where Sega and of course Nintendo were the key players in the home console market. While on first glance, The Messenger seems yet another cynical attempt to use retro stylings to hook into your cash, once you get through the first three or so hours, it really begins to show its class. The twist is of course well known. The Messenger is a 16-bit explorative Metroidvania within a linear 8-bit shell, with all the right aspects from way back when to keep folks like us all warm and fuzzy. Thankfully though it isn't a faithful tribute as it's done away with most of the things from the time we really didn't like. The platforming's fully decent without asking you to guess where you should be going or having you undertake a series of blind jumps. A mechanic that still sounds as stupid as it must have done when it was first put into practice 20 or so years ago. We're also really taken on how the messenger handles its difficulty level. Unlike games from way back when, it never feels as if there's too much going on. Back in the time this game is emulating and greatly improving on, you'd often find level sections with so many enemies and so much weaponry coming your way, you tended to beat the damn game through a modicum of skill and a huge dose of lady luck giving you the wink at the right time. The same goes for the writing, the story, the characters, put simply, they don't suck. Unlike nearly all of the stories and characters from the games and messengers taking inspiration from. 
all in, this is an excellent package, from the graphics to the music to the narrative and everything in between. Yes, it is a throwback, although when compared to its non-retro-inspired gaming peers of the last few years, it really does hold its own amongst the very best of them. Into the Breach our number 7, launched in late February, and it comes from the team who brought us FTL, and with it comes a familiar roguelike system and fingernail-biting tension. We've spent a good few moments trying to articulate the USP for what Into the Breach really offers, although it's easy to muddy the water with a drawn-out explanation, so here goes. It's kind of like a waiting-at-the-bus-stop friendly game of chess. Here you pilot an army of mechs against a horde of bugs, with each mission taking place on a grid where games typically last no more than between 5 or 10 minutes. Now our interest in turn-based strategy games, well it comes and goes. We haven't played too many this year, and yet Into the Breach stands out this 2018 in the way it forces you to understand and accept any errors were your mistake alone and nothing to do with dodgy random moments to which you have no control. It's exact in how it plays, particularly on how a poor first couple of moves can really set you back. At times we felt genuine anger upon setting up and actioning a duff choice, only to see the destruction unfold when it was perfectly obvious the move to have taken was right in front of our face the whole time, which drove us to play this again, and again, and again in an attempt to beat the damn thing, and to get closure, we felt come the end, we richly deserved. At number 6, Minute from April dropped with the distinctive twist of having you die every 60 seconds, before putting you back from wherever the current starting position happens to be. While squarely aimed at the speedrunning community, that's not particularly our thing, although having access to an exploration adventure game we could play in 60 second increments sounded like something to look at, especially given our busy family centric lifestyle. We deliberately tackled Minute in small bite sized chunks, usually in handheld mode on the Switch while out and about, or in moments grabbed between say doing the laundry, or such as packing the kids lunch boxes for school. Sure, we're presenting a fairly unique gaming use case, which you may have no frame of reference, although yet Minute nails this type of quick-fire approach to gaming consumption. It's just so easy to pick up and play for a few minutes, pun definitely intended, before going on to do other things to then come back to it sometime later to start things up once more. While the top-down Zelda-like graphics are fine, as is the plinky plonky soundtrack, they don't in themselves make for the usual game of the year material. What does, however, get Minute into this list, aside from meeting the use case we mentioned earlier, is how much personality oozes from the character and those you meet while going about your business. The writing screams quality throughout, as does the little design markers, giving you subtle clues as to where to go next as does the inventory management system and persistence of certain items that when packaged together, they all work exceptionally well. Minute continually surprised us and brought on many a smile as we pressed through it. This really is top draw stuff, however you choose to play it. At first glance, Iconoclast appears just to be another 2D pixel art game of the type we see day after day. The sort of game you see all the time when you're flicking through Steam or the Nintendo eShop, and we began playing it back in January with reasonably low expectations. Our first impressions were best as described as saying, well, it looks okay. The individual character animations and backgrounds are perfectly fine, as is the soundtrack that comes with it. Perfectly fine enough isn't a label usually applied for Game of the Year material, so why is Iconoclast so far towards the pointy end of this year's countdown? Well, that's a fairly easy one. After a couple of hours with Iconoclast, it's clear as far as platforming games go, everything you can do is so buttery smooth and gracefully implemented that it feels and plays like platforming perfection. Your character is such a joy to move, as is the combat with its running and gunning, together with the nuanced upgrade system that's focused on boosting your physical abilities. This nuance slides into other sections too, with iconoclasts opting for an environmental-based puzzle system to forge your way through to your destination. Such puzzles can be frustratingly subtle and offer air-punching levels of satisfaction when bested. We also deeply enjoyed and were honestly shocked how touching and involved we became within the story. 
Certain sections and elements remain with us close to 11 months after we watched the credits roll. So while we began Iconoclast with below floor level expectations, it firmly executes upon its premise and makes Iconoclast one of the most compelling experiences of any 2D platformer we've ever played. Number 4 Celeste tells a story of a young woman making her way up the titular mountain with it coming out in late January. Paired back to its base components, you guide your character through hundreds of rooms full of spikes and other such nasties. We played Celeste for evenings on end when it launched. The joy and sense of accomplishment of making it through some of the rooms where your jumping skills need to be almost on a per pixel accuracy level, well it kept us coming back time and time again. We talk a lot here on Get Indie Gaming about wanting to be satisfied with the games we play and in Celeste, there's so much of this to be gained from how easy your character is to control. The eight directional phases of movement, it's just simply sublime. Celeste doesn't need any fancy power-ups or other such embellishments to make controlling the character feel any better. To do so would be to gild the lily, as the phrase no one ever really says, and while you slide your character around the rooms and even during periods of multiple failures, every aspect of the control feels wonderfully intuitive. Yes, Celeste is a hard game, although it comes with a fine assist mode where you're able to adjust a number of the options. This will help the overall access and opportunity should you want to play, for example, at a slower speed or perhaps with infinite stamina. The assist mode is also a fine addition for people with certain traits that may exclude them from playing and enjoying the game. While purists may scoff, we loathe difficulty-based content gatekeeping and with Celeste, that issue is tactfully taken care of. With the enjoyable gameplay comes an equally well-constructed narrative with an overriding sense of goodness and hope. Likewise, the characters and people you meet along the way are well-written and easy to relate to. Also, the colour pixel art is as good as anything we've seen all year. Celeste is brilliant, and while we've not played it for six or so months, it remains etched into our memories as something very, very special. Greece, our number three, Spanish for Grey, is quintessentially why Game of the Year coverage should happen towards the end of the year, and not like ours from 2017 where we put it out in November. In doing so, we missed Gorogoa, and had we done the same this year, Greece would also have been left out. On looks alone, this is the most beautiful thing to come to market all year, if not ever, with its almost watercolour-like visual quality surpassing anything previously used as the yardstick when describing a game as having a painterly nature. Greece earns its place in our countdown for many reasons. While mostly of an abstract nature, its intricate gameplay, the spine-tingling music score, the masterful implementation of the sound effects such as the rain and water, what it can show and teach us about the nature of fear, how it uses analogy and harmony with the visuals and all together build on the work from such games as Electroplankton, Journey and Ori in the Blind Forest to further elevate and push forward and legitimise the perception of video games as honest to goodness pieces of interactive art by way of their visuals, narrative and empathy they can elicit while playing. In all honesty, Go into Greece with the view that it's something to experience rather than something to play to beat. For everything we've already said, it's exceptional, absolutely wonderful, and please, go get this played. Our runner-up, Return of the Obra Din from Lucas Pope, the developer behind Papers Please, is exceptionally classy and by far the biggest surprise of the year. The Obra Dinn has drifted into port having disappeared some six years ago, and it's your role to find out what happened to those on board with the assistance of a rather special pocket watch. This timepiece, a memento mortem, offers a view into the last moments of the crew and passengers, with you then being able to try to piece together from the bones you come across, their identity, how they died, and if necessary, who killed them. The cause of death is usually fairly easy, a tragic accident, being shot by a crewmate or something way more sinister. Piecing together who a given jumble of bones used to be, however, well that's much harder and it forces you to rely on your own deductive reasoning, or a YouTube playthrough, to complete the mystery. 
Oberdin is very clever. It also happens to be one of the most enjoyable puzzle games you can play on any platform. But why, and with so many others to choose from, well that's one heck of a bold statement. Well what Obra Dinn manages to pull off comes from an almost perfect mix of its components. The visuals, while minimal, are in places breathtaking. The sound from the musical ditties to the voice acting is sublime throughout, and the story, well, we can't really discuss that in too much detail as it's so key to the experience, and yet it's superbly written and wonderfully engaging all the way through it. We just wanted to keep playing to see and hear more and more. What's also astounding in what the Obradin does is how it interacts with the players, or more likely how you interact with the game. Very few, if any others, treat those playing it with such reverence. There's no hand-holding or guides with it, assuming you have the grey matter to figure it all out. Now in these terms, the Obra Dinn is a highly empowering experience that took an utterly phenomenal piece of work to keep it from being our game of the year. Over the years, we've played many hundreds of indie games, and in our minds, Dead Cells is the best we've ever played. There we said it, and let me concisely explain. We play video games to be entertained, and on what Motion Twin have achieved with Dead Cells, it's an extraordinary piece of theatre. Right from the start, with more than 100 hours under the belt across three different platforms, Dead Cells feels like a literal gaming equivalent of the best roller coaster ever, without the long, slow drag from getting on board to the first initial drop. From the beginning, combat is white knuckle levels of fun. The weaponry is substantial, and while a hard game, the difficulty is handled and implemented in a way that facilitates accessibility, largely through the permanent nature of the player upgrades. Dead Cells also benefits from how adaptive it can be to suit whatever play style that fits your mood and your purpose. You want a fighting-based platformer? Dead Cells can do it. You want strategy and exploration? Dead Cells can do that. You want a puzzler? Guess what? Dead Cells is your game too. All in, it's nearly perfect, but not quite. The world's random generation, as they usually do, can give odd level layouts. The combat can be heavily weighted against you, with zero chance of you getting the better of your assailants. And even though this comes as a frustrating annoyance, it's still an entertaining annoyance, which is, after all, why we play video games. We want to be entertained. Dead Cells is astounding. It's brilliant, and not only the best indie game of 2018, it is the best indie game ever made. With Dead Cells taking our game of the year, it's time to ask what games you most enjoyed playing and which ones would make it into your Game of the Year top 5 or top 10 lists. Let us know down in the comments and we look forward to seeing your choices and perhaps picking up on a few games we missed over the year. One quick thing before we go, many thanks for joining us here over the past 12 months. It's been one heck of a ride from the highs of our E3 coverage to the little break we took in the summer to move overseas. As we bound into the new year, we have big plans for Get Indie Gaming and we're super excited to have you all along with us for the ride. Many thanks once again for watching, and we look forward to welcoming you all here again very soon.